first installment of our Radar Scope webinar series. We're going to be talking about the basics today. But first, let me introduce you to Mike Wolfenbarg, who is the guru of Radar Scope. Good afternoon or morning, everyone, and welcome to the first installment in our Radar Scope Lunch and Learn series. I'm Mike Wolfenbarger, and I'll be your host. I'd like to introduce Daphne Thompson, who heads up our meteorological outreach. Daphne will be presenting today's radar scope topic, and at the end, I will show you the recent integration of radar scope into our cloud-based enterprise platform and touch on a few of the many benefits our clients receive with its actionable weather intelligence. Before I turn this over to Daphne, I'd like to briefly tell you about weather decision technologies. You're with us today because you use Radar Scope, which is one of the top three mobile weather apps available on the mobile market today, with more than 300,000 users globally. We're excited that 500 of you could join us today. Another fact about WDT is that we hold and license 58 patents related to weather detection technologies. I can tell you we're not even close to being done leading that charge. You, as customers of WDT, are the reason we keep innovating. I'll now turn this over to Daphne. She holds a degree in meteorology from the University of Oklahoma and brings to WDT a deep pool of knowledge. Her previous experience includes working at the National Weather Center, the Norman Emergency Management Office, and the National Weather Service. And Daphne serves in a meteorological capacity for WDT. Daphne, you have the audience. Hi, everyone. So today we're going to be talking about a lot of basics on radar. You can see um, our topics for the day will be basics on how radar works, data varies from storms at different distances, and frequent updates in faster data. So let's get started with the basics. So a lot of people have seen radars like this, and they think they're giant golf balls. Instead, what we're looking at is a fiberglass ray dome. Inside that is the weather radar. The pattern of the radar was designed to prevent the radar beam from being blocked. It also protects the radar from the elements. One thing to be aware of is that radar beams do not look like lightsabers because the beam is not uniform. Instead, a radar beam more resembles a flashlight. As the beam gets further and further away, it becomes wider and higher. A radar beam rotates with the within the radome, and it elevates when it's looking for weather. These are called tilts. It is important to note that radars do not look at ground level. They're actually looking higher into the storms. The National Weather Service has radars located all over the United States. These are referred to as WSR-88Ds, which stands for Weather Surveillance Radar 88 for the year it was developed, and D for Doppler. There are a total of 164 of these sites in the United States. And this includes Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico. There are also 45 terminal Doppler weather radars, also known as TDWRs. They're located at airports. They are used to detect weather that could affect aircraft, such as wind shear and precipitation. Placed in thunderstorm-prone areas, they assist air traffic controllers by producing high-resolution data. When looking at the radars displayed on radar scope, you can tell the difference by viewing the name of the radar. A WSR-88D identifier will start with a K, while a TDWR identifier starts with a T. Let's compare an image from a WSR-88D to that of a TDWR. The radars I'm using are very close to each other, and the images were taking it, taken at nearly the same time. Here you can see rain and small thunderstorms around Wichita, Kansas. Note that in the lower left corner, it says the beam elevation is 0.5 degrees. Now let's see what a TDWR image looks like. They use a different color table, so that's one difference. The beam is also looking lower that is on the, than it is on the 88D. Again, look at the lower left corner and you can see the elevation here is 0.2 degrees. Although the very light rain showers do not show up, the heavier rain is very visible. So let's check that out. We can see that by going back and forth. 
the heavier rain is, still remains there. An air traffic controller would probably zoom in closer than I am in order to see the higher resolution data in more detail. Another difference between these two radars is the distance that the beam extends to gather data. The beam range on a WSR-88D is about 143 miles from the side of the radar. Here you can see the range extends southward towards Oklahoma City and north past Topeka. Because the TDWR has a thinner beam, it is able to see in higher resolution. But that means the beam is not able to go as far. The range is only about 56 miles from the side of the radar. That is why it's used for airports. You can give much better details for storms nearby when planes are landing. All right, our next section is about how data varies. Let's look at some more radar scope images. Here we see some storms located near Frederick, Oklahoma and extending further north. When a radar is far away from the storms, the beam has further to go. This means the beam is pretty wide by the time it gets to the storm. It also means that the beam has broadened like a flashlight beam does. So far, a storm far away from the beam is actually looking very high up into the storm. Weather occurring at low levels may get to you earlier than you thought. So make sure you know what you're looking at before making any major decisions based on radar. Using the radar scope distance tool, we can find out exactly how far we are looking and how high up the beam is when it gets to the storm. In this case, the Frederick storm is over 125 miles away from the radar located near Oklahoma City. This causes the beam to be nearly 14,000 feet up in the storm. Let's look at that exact same storm, but this time we're using a radar that is nearby. When storms are closer to the radar, the beam doesn't need to go as far. This means the beam does not widen much. It also means that because the beam isn't as high into the storm, you will get a more accurate image of what is occurring. Weather may still reach you sooner than expected since the radar is not looking at ground level. Let's use the distance tool again. The closer radar is actually very near to the storm approaching Frederick. Now radar is less than five miles away from the storm, causing the beam height to only be 200 feet up. That's much better than the last image where the beam was close to 14,000 feet high. Here we're looking at the same images again. On the left, the radar near Oklahoma City, depicted as a star, was quite far away from the storm. On the right, again depicted by a star, we see the Frederick radar, which was very close to the storm. If we zoom in on the storm near the town of Frederick, you can see how blocky the image is. Remember, the radar beam is pretty wide at this point and high up into the storm. Now let's zoom in using the closer radar. This image is much more detailed. The size of the storm is also more accurate. Comparing the two, you can see why you would want to view storms with the closest radar available. If you turn on the storm track tool, you can also learn more about the path of the storm. Each of the tick marks signifies where the storm will be in 15 minute periods. This basically uses a mathematical algorithm or formula to try and forecast where the storm will be depending on how fast and what direction it is currently moving. Over time, this can also vary if the storm changes speed or direction. When there are multiple storms in the area, each will be labeled and have their own paths displayed. All right, now we're going to talk about faster data. Radars are always on, night or day, storms or clear skies. Here we have a loop of data. This is on a normal day with rain showers. You can see the showers are moving to the northeast. I'm going to play it again. This time watch the clock. You can see the images are coming in about every four to five minutes. 
So this loop is about an hour and 20 minutes long. Now let's watch a loop of a severe storm that produced a tornado. Let's play that once more. And again, look at the clock. On a severe weather day, the radar spin faster and gather data images every one to two minutes. This loop is about 30 minutes long. Because of that, the storm appears more ominous. It's always a good idea to check how fast images are coming in. It can make a big difference on when that storm gets to you. Well, that concludes lesson one, but don't forget to come back next week for the next session. Now I'm going to turn this over to Marcus to close out today's presentation. Thank you, Daphne, for sharing your uh, expertise and knowledge with us today. Uh, but we're not done just yet. We're still talking about radar scope, and I'm really excited to tell you about the recent weather ops update that now includes radar scope. With this recent integration of radar scope into our enterprise platform, our clients are enjoying the benefits of high resolution radar data that you've all enjoyed. But combined with other incredible tools that were already part of weather ops, it's like radar scope on steroids. Now, with this week being Business Continuity Week, uh, a portion of, this portion of today's presentation is for those of you that are interested in how Radar Scope can help your organization minimize rest, risk, protect your human assets, and your bottom line. So what is Weather Ops? It's a cloud-based meteorological decision support portal that provides information to support critical decisions as they relate to disruptive or dangerous weather. Our weather ops solutions bridges information and timing gaps by providing the same critical information regardless of geographical location to key personnel using the best methods of delivery such as email, text messaging, or mobile device push. There's no more coming back to the table and discuss the differing bits of information everyone receives separately and then create a plan. Our team taps you on the shoulder well in advance and when we do alert you, your key team members can receive the same alerts, allowing them to instantly put plans into action. This directly impacts the bottom line in a very positive way. Here's how it all works. We call this our forecast funnel, and it's the typical flow for disseminating forecast and threat information. It starts with our daily planner. These are issued once daily at 6 a.m. by our team of forecasters, and it's color-coded to allow for easy identification of the types of threats you choose for your assets. This planner is completely customizable in terms of the criteria that is impactful to your organization. The hazardous weather outlook is part of, a pre, is part of the preemptive taps on the shoulder. That hazardous weather outlook is also issued daily by our team and is in-depth analysis of potential hazard, hazardous weather that could affect your business. Key forecast drivers and forecast justifications, probability-driven assessments for each key weather parameters, and regional discussions can be sent as needed or required during peri periods of hazardous or inclement weather. Like the Daily Planner, our weather checks uh, is still that same color-coded, easy reference identification of those threats uh, periods to get you ahead of making critical decisions related to adverse weather. Threats that were identified in advance using the Daily Planner are broken down in the weather checks as the events draw closer. Weather checks are useful in timing guidance by identifying key hazardous periods over the next two days in, in smaller time blocks. Storm advisories and alerts uh, are short fuse event driven alerts. These alerts will provide you with details on exact timing and threat type. There's over 20 categories that we alert for, uh, primarily severe storms, tornadoes, heavy rain, high winds, And with this platform, you stay connected and informed no matter where you are. Combined with our mobile decision support companion, you have instant access to radar, daily planners, weather checks, and alerts. You'll never wonder again if it's time to take action. Now, I'm sure each of you have something to take away from today's session. Maybe you learned something new, or you were able to confirm something that you were already thinking. I hope that you feel more confident in understanding radar and how it works and using radar scope more and more. If you currently use radar scope to help your company react to weather threats, 
Give me a call and let's discover how Weather Ops can help you better prepare and react. And with that, this concludes today's session. Thank you all for joining and have a great rest of your day.